to introduce Kelly McSween. Did I pronounce your last name correct? Yep, that's perfect. Thanks. Um, Kelly uh, grew up in Salem, Oregon and attends the University of Oregon where she's a junior. She has an ambitious uh, study program of international relations, economics, and Spanish. And uh, she says she loves politics, foreign policy, developmental economics, and Latin American studies. Other than that, she's kind of bored during the day. And um, she says one day she hopes to work for the US State Department. In her Vita that she sent me, she says she loves Spain and loved the people and loved the food and loved the language. We have a winery in Southern Oregon that developed this whole philosophy around that very thing. Abasala was uh, based on tapas in Spain. So anyway, when Kelly contacted me, she said uh, she would like to uh, talk about the Borgen Project. And uh, with that, I'll introduce Kelly. Thanks for coming. Thanks so much. So as you said, I'm Kelly. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for letting me present. Um, you guys do great things. And I actually was uh, participated in a Rotary Youth Exchange back when I was in high school. And it was one of the, like, the best experiences. It kind of projected me into this kind of academic and also like career path of doing things uh, related to like international studies. So um, thank you guys for being a part of such an amazing club. Um, and I'm gonna... Hopefully share. Okay. Nice. Can you guys see that okay? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so um, starting this past September, I was awarded a wonderful opportunity to intern with the Borgen Project. And um, their mission is to diminish global poverty around the world. Um, so they believe that the leaders of the most powerful nation on earth, which the US, um, can do more to address global poverty. So they're an innovative national campaign that is working to make global poverty um, a focus of the US foreign policy. And I'll go into more how they do that in later. So a little bit about um, the Borgen Project. Um, they started in 2003 and they're a nonprofit. Um, it was started by a guy named Clint Borgen and he was volunteering um, in uh, in the refugee camps during the Kosovo war and genocide. And he recognized um, the great need for aid programs around the world and just the um, harsh conditions of poverty um, and how he really thought that uh, the United States could do more um, giving aid. And so he uh, went to work starting the organization. He went to uh, Dutch Harbor, Alaska and was working on a fishing vessel trying to get um, some funding for just starting the organization and so he started up got some volunteers and um, so now uh, fast forward to 2020 there's um, volunteers and advocates in 931 cities across the United States so it's wow. been doing really well so here's the focus of their advocacy so we um, focus on different legislation that's focused on um, starvation global food security um, access to education, access to clean water and sanitation, and newborn child and mother survival. So how we operate, um, uh, we focus a lot on obviously advocacy. And so we meet with US congressional leaders to support, to secure support for crucial poverty reducing legislation. So as an intern, I um, will eventually be able to have a meeting with one of the congressional leaders for Oregon. So that's super exciting. And um, a lot of the different um, members of the organization get to meet directly with people that have a lot of say in um, legislation. So another really important thing that we do is mobilize people. And so um, we, I guess, encourage people to um, support our efforts and by emailing and contacting um, their congressional leaders. And I'll talk more about that because mobilization is really important for our cause. And we also focus a lot on educating. We um, teach basic advocacy skills that allow citizens to make poverty a political priority. And lastly, our issue message, we use our uh, online website 
to promote our um, awareness and just knowledge of global issues and how we can reduce poverty. So here's just an example of how we work, and also our past success. So in 2016, the Borgen Project advocated for the Global Food Security Act. And so basically doing that, they met with congressional leaders, they had their interns and volunteers um, uh, mobilize people to email and call their congressional leaders in support of this act. And so um, with all that support and advocacy, um, it was passed in 2019. And in 2016, sorry. And um, so as of 2019, 23 million people now live above the poverty line and 5 million families are no longer suffering from hunger. And this act um, helped increase sustainable growth, um, such as improved agricultural practices, women's empowerment and food security. So that's just, um, that's what we're always working towards. We have a bunch of different um, legislation that we, um, support and so we're always working towards getting that passed and helping people um, escape poverty. So here's some benefits of diminishing global poverty because a lot of people ask why is it important um, and also why would I even want to support this like for myself and so um, first thing um, when we, when, we in, when we invest in um, other countries and help other people escape poverty um, there is a return on investment for the United States. And so every time someone escapes poverty and their economy develops, now they're able to um, consume different products of whether it's now they're able to buy toothpaste or they're able to buy um, more food products, things like that. Um, that's uh, an expansion of US markets. And so that helps create um, US jobs, US growth. So um, it's a return on investment. Um, additionally, um, uh, supporting uh, global poverty also um, helps improve U.S. national security. So when people are in environments where poverty, there's lots of poverty, um, it's typically um, a place that can sometimes turn violent. And so um, having more stability in a region and also um, helping people have the resources they need to survive um, helps um, with peace, the peace process and um, just promoting stability. And then finally, um, less overpopulation. So um, when people are in, a lot of times when they're in poverty, they, fam they believe that, um, and not that they believe, they um, have to have a lot of children. So um, to be able to produce enough um, agriculture, have enough um, I guess sources of income. A lot of families will have six plus kids. And so um, when they are given the resources that they need and they have that they're not in poverty, people actually produce less children. So it helps our earth, I guess, to not have such a problem with overpopulation. So helps the climate as well. And then here's our current legislative focus. We're really focusing on the global response to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And um, we really believe that pandemics have no borders and everybody around the world um, needs protection, especially right now. So we're really working towards uh, an emergency supplemental passed uh, a bill for the international affairs budget. And so um, right now, um, it's less than 1% of the package is um, for international funding. That was what, sorry, the first supplemental that was passed, only one, less than 1% was for um, international aid for the pandemic. So we're hoping, um, we're supporting a $20 billion um, supplemental for the national affairs budget to fight COVID around the world, which will go towards global health programs, emergency economic relief, food aid, agriculture, and, and the vaccine alliance. So. And now I'm gonna talk about the importance of mobilization. So um, basically how we work is a lot of the advocates, volunteers, and staff will have meetings with congressional leaders um, working to get certain legislation passed. But at the same time, a lot of our supporters are 
calling and emailing their congressional leaders and that's also making such a huge contribution to our um, our mission so it really adds up all the different calls and emails every single week so um, each week congressional offices tally up um, issues that people call in to their district about whether it's via email a phone call or written letter so for example um, if i called in and I said, please support the international affairs budget or please support the Girls Lead Act, something like that, they would put a tally. And then at the end of the week, they would send that in to the Senator and say, we had 60 people call in to in support of the international affairs budget or we had a hundred or something like that. So um, the senators really know what um, their constituents want and what they um, want them to support in Congress. And so, it's not uncommon for a leader to support a poverty reduction bill after as few as seven to 10 people call in in support of it. So um, it's really influential and really important. So the Borgen Project um, focuses on this and through their website, they have pre-made templates for emails. So um, you can go online and basically just click on a certain bill that you want to support and you can click email and so then you type in your name and your address it pops up your senators and representatives and it formats an email to them and then it sends them and super easy process you don't have to write anything um, they do everything for you and you're able to still um, get the message across um, it's also super easy to call so um, you can call your congressional leaders anytime. Um, you can just say, hi, um, I'm a constituent of Senator Merkley, and I would, I please protect the international affairs budget. Super easy. So whether it's you're calling in to um, ask to support the international affairs budget, or you could call in and say, please support some other um, act that's going through, like that would help people in Eugene, anything. So I think just knowing that being like you can call your congressional leaders and they really do pay attention to what their constituents is just really cool and really like influential. And I really um, urge all of you to get involved politically and know that your response will be heard. So um, overall, the Borgen Project's message is um, we can all do better when we all do better. So I really believe that we all band together and um, work together, there can be a lot of really great progressive change. So um, thanks so much. And I really, their website is great. There's so much information on there. So if you ever want to learn more, it's just borgenproject.org. But thanks so much for listening. And I really appreciate you guys letting me present. Thank you. Um... We have a lot of time, since Kelly was so succinct, we have a lot of time for questions and answers. And knowing this group, there's probably, I love the logo, we can all do better when we all do better. I mean, there's some people on Facebook that I wanna send that to today. <laughs> that um, something to think about, Susie. Um, a question that I just put in the chat box, um, something I've always wondered about, is there one, form of communication that seems to be more impactful in communicating with our uh, legislators, like email versus text versus phone call? Versus um, I, I would say that email right now is the most influential just because um, a lot of the congressional leaders aren't in their like state offices. So just because of COVID, they're working from home. So a lot of the correspondence people um, see the emails faster and you'll get a response faster from like sending an email. So thank you. Yeah. I see that Kathy Hoffer had a real interesting question in the chat box. You want to share it, Kathy? Well, I just got stuck on the initial statement of the US being the most powerful nation. And I like the idea and Susie and I were chatting back and forth about considering ourselves as being a, a generous nation, but you know, for one thing, I wonder about our position in the world right now. And um, I think we have some rebuilding to do to make our nation, and whether we wanna really be the most powerful nation in the world. I mean, 
So that was just a, a question. And given that it was the first statement in the mission, it's like, have you thought about, has anybody brought that up before? I personally, I always have a hard time sometimes saying that because that is our mission statement. And just from my own studies, I personally don't typically like saying that because um, I think right now we do have a lot of bridges that we need to mend, especially in the international community. So um, I think the reason I think we, the mission statement is how it is, is um, only about less than 1% of the US budget goes towards foreign aid. And a lot of people think, oh, it must be way higher than that, but it's really a really, really small proportion of um, the US budget. So um, that's where they really believe that such a large power in the world, whether it's the largest or not, they believe that they can um, contribute more financially towards um, aid around the world for just humanitarian um, efforts. Um, yeah, I don't know. It just seems like something that you might wanna bring up and consider. It, it seems like it sets us as being superior. And I just don't like the tone of it being the introductory statement. No, I would totally agree. Yeah, yeah pow I think powerful just has a, it, it packs a lot of garbage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially now after what we've been through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Randy. Uh, well, yeah, uh, the word choice, um, but I think the idea, at least I like to think that the idea about it is that power in terms of our access to resources. Yes, exactly. Resources, not necessarily, for example, our military or something like that. Um, but we, well, we certainly are per capita consumers of resources um, that, um, I don't, I don't, I don't mean to, I don't want to go across the line for political, um, but, I, but I do feel like if we are um, consuming as much as we do, we have a responsibility um, to mm -hmm. our planet, uh, to others on our planet. Yeah. yeah, that's a good way to put it. I totally agree. And I also think it's important that um, I usually like to say um, that I think it's a privilege that I can even advocate for other people. So I think um, just the resources that we have here and um, our ability to help others is so great that we should be helping or we have the potential to really make a lot of impact. So. Okay, I saw John Yapel had a hand up and then uh, Gary Brown has a hand up. The only comment There's that I would more. like to add is the fact that Yes, the government only gives 1%, but I'm assuming that 1% probably exceeds anybody else in the world. And secondly, the philanthropic groups in this country are unprecedented. The Gates Foundation, even down to Nancy Hughes' stove tea, we ourselves do more for individuals in this world than any other country. So I think when you add up all the rest, <laughs> I wouldn't get a down on it. We're, we're doing a heck of a job of trying to make this a better world. Good point. I would, yeah. I would agree, but I also think why, I mean, we still have a lot of resources. There's always more to strive for. I never think striving for better is, I guess, a bad thing. Okay, I saw Gary and then I saw Ron. Yeah, Kelly, I wonder, does your organization work with other international groups I'm prioritizing like World Health Organization or um, the World Bank or, or Melinda Gates Foundation. I mean, others that are doing things, is it a separate kind of initiative or do you do things that get prioritized with uh, other groups? So we only work um, mainly through just US foreign aid. So we just work to get things passed through Congress. Mm -hmm. We don't work with like other um, nonprofits and like other or aid organizations. So just US, yeah. And then I saw Ron. Yeah, and I was just gonna say, you know, our country throws a lot of money at things that don't necessarily uh, have demonstrable benefit, but I think one of the values is, are the human resources we produce in this country and people like ourselves as Rotarians. I think we're proud to be Rotarians. It's one of the most powerful international bodies. 
uh, working uh, that we wouldn't say, well, we're second class to this and that organization. We don't want, really want to try mm -hmm. to take charge. There's nothing wrong with, I think, having pride in the good that you do. And I was just going to mention to Kelly, it's, it's pronounced Kosovo. And Sean McGann uh, was part of our uh, recent symposium talking about the work uh, that we're doing. So we had Oregonians from the Guard devoted a year of their effort. I mean, they were called to, to duty to go to Kosovo and work with the people there. And uh, I think Sean would be a good one to also follow up to tell, you know, uh, what we know about uh, our military forces are put to a lot of good use, probably more than any other uh, military service in the world uh, in terms of what we do going into countries all around the world. So there's a lot of good. We don't need to be ashamed of what we do as uh, the United States. I totally That's agree. as political as hell, yeah. <laughs> be proud of your country. Jean has her hand up. So I have a question for Kelly. Um, how do you um, envision your experience as an intern with the Borgen Project, project as uh, helping you or being a tool in um, progressing to your future, tra your trajectory to your future goals? So um, I think this internship is really just taught me a lot about just the legislative process, um, different how Congress works, a lot of how like aid is voted on in Congress, goes to the State Department. So um, I've just learned a lot. And so I think going forward, like working in policy or foreign policy, um, no, having like just a lot of knowledge of like the congressional um, process will help a lot. And also just having the experience, I think, put on my for future reference is going to help me get other opportunities that will be um, more towards what I'm looking for so hey I see Doug just joined us any other questions or comments or discussion 